have our guest speaker, Kathy Laughlin. Um, Mrs. Laughlin lived in the Middle East for 20 years, from infancy till age of 18. She lived in Libya, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. In the meanwhile, also, she has traveled to many other countries, including Turkey, Morocco, Iraq, and Palestine. And she's currently a World Health, World Health History teacher at Sandy Spring Friends School. She teaches AP World History, Middle Eastern Studies, and a competitive government. She will be speaking today about her experience while living there. Um, she will be speaking about multiple stuff, cultural traditions, um, challenges she faced there. Hope you all enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much for having me today. Some of you look a little bit familiar from when I uh, taught in uh, Professor Odeda's class last semester. Um, let me just start by asking uh, how many of you have a passport other than American passport? Yeah, I had a feeling. I had a feeling I would be <laughs> among friends here. Yeah. Okay, so I don't always try to explain where I'm from, but when I do, I immediately regret it. How many of you guys feel that way? Yeah. Um, I really felt this way, not so much when I was living over there, but when I came back here. And by back here, I actually mean Canada. I didn't come here until I got married. Um, and I didn't return to Canada until I was 18, after I graduated from high school, and I, and I went to go to university there. And people would ask me all the time, where are you from? And I really would go out of my way never to answer the question, because it's a very complicated story, right? So. I am not an anthropologist, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a psychologist, right? I just have kind of an unusual background. And actually, for me, it's kind of mundane because it was just my life, and so I don't really think that much about it. Um, and I certainly don't talk that much about it, even, even today. Um, uh, although I teach students, most of them don't know that much about me. Most of them assume by looking at me um, that I am an American, that I was born and raised here. In fact, I do not have American citizenship. Uh, I have Canadian and Australian citizenship. I am married to an American, and I have three children, and um, by birth they are American. Um, I've been in the United States for 24 years, and I have chosen not to take American citizenship for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of them is that I don't really have a sense of nationalism, a sense of patriotism, and part of it is because I lived most of my life outside of my own passport holding country. So what is home, right? This is a really difficult question, especially for people like us. Um, is it a place? Is it the address on your street, right? Is it where your mom and dad are from? Um, is it where you went to school? Um, is it the people that you know? Is it the friends that you had growing up, right? Is it an extended family, your aunts and your uncles and your cousins? Um, is it simply a feeling? And I think it's probably a combination of all of those things, um, unless you happen to move around a lot like, like I did. <laughs> so <clears throat> um, how do you self-identify if your roots are a little bit rootless, which, which mine were? Um, so this is kind of this idea about what is culture, right? So most of you, I hope, realize that you become acculturated um, by what you see around you, and particularly as children. It's much more difficult as an adult to take on a different culture. So you start speaking the language of your parents. You speak the language of the country where you're being raised. You take on attributes of that culture that's around you. You take on the values, the belief systems, the norms, the customs, right? Um, it's difficult when you don't really own those values as well. So my culture is my identity and my personality. It gives me spiritual, intellectual, and emotional, emotional distinction from others, and I'm proud of it. Um, so what then gives you these things? What gives you your sense of self and your sense of culture? Um, it can be what you see around you every day. What I saw around me every day was, for the most part, I saw Arabs, right? I saw a lot of desert. 
Um, I was living there not today, where it's much more westernized and much more modern, um, but I was living in the Middle East from the 1960s until the 1980s. And that was a period of enormous development in the region, um, but not nearly as fast as it's developing today. We were just talking about this. If you go to the Middle East and then two years later you go back today, it's changed radically. And that wasn't so much the case when I was there. It was still very much juxtaposed between sort of the West and the place itself. So the sites, you know, what is your tribe? You guys, this is like a new word that everyone likes to use, what's your tribe? But basically it's a sense of belonging, how you self-identify. Okay, is it based on sound? So for those of you who have been to the Middle East, like what is one of the first things that you think about when you think about sound? Okay, absolutely, language. What else? Please. Yes, the music. Yeah, what else? There's something really distinct. The cult. Yes, exactly, right? The muezzin, the call to prayer. And that was something that I grew up with five times a day my, my whole life, right? And when I didn't hear it, it was weird. And now when I go back, and I still do go back, I cannot wait for the first time I hear it. Okay, and the smells. All right, so I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I swear to you, heat has a smell, right? Like, just the way it sits on you and gets into you, and the way it makes sand smell, um, and the way exhaust smells when it's mixed with heat. Like, there's definitely an identifying feeling about being hot, and a lot of the places that I live were really, really hot. Um, how do any of us attain our culture, our sense of identity and belonging? So it's all of these things and things that are much more subtle. What about tastes? I have to say I love any kind of Arabic food. I have a special place in my heart for Lebanese and Palestinian food. Um, not so much Egyptian food. <laughs> Does anyone here ever eat Egyptian food? Have you ever tried Malhaya? Oh, I can't do it. It's like the one thing I really can't do. <laughs> but almost anything else I love, all right? And then where do we require our beliefs, our customs, our memories, and our relationships? So a lot of this stuff is really subliminal. People don't really think about their culture. You don't think about where all of this stuff comes from until you have to, right? And I didn't think about it growing up because just like everybody else, I just took it for granted. And it wasn't until I came back, which is called re-entry, by the way, um, that I really started to think about what this meant because all of a sudden, it changed. It literally changed with one airplane ride. My whole life changed. Even my sense of identity changed. And then, of course, language. We talked about this in terms of sound. So even now in a crowd, if I hear Arabic, it doesn't matter where I am. Right? I'll turn around and look because that's what I'm used to hearing. It really triggers something because that's what you grow up with. And then, of course, religion. There's no way you can talk about the Middle East or the Arab world without talking about religion or being aware of religion because Islam is so profoundly pervasive in the culture. Okay, and then customs, right? Which is kind of all of this put together. All right, so I was born in Australia. All right, so the concept of home doesn't mean the same thing. Even filling out your home address on official documents makes you uneasy if you don't have a very solid sense of home. Um, you end up feeling that you can fit in anywhere. I think I have pretty astute uh, cultural knowledge and cultural understanding, cultural um, fluency, for example, but I'm always a little bit awkward, especially in the West. All right, that's me. I was born in Brisbane, Australia in 1967. Uh, my mother is Australian and my father is Canadian. My father was there working when they met. Um, when I was six months old, we moved to Libya. So any guess what my dad did for a living? It's like two or three. Hmm? No, nope. boom, oil. Yeah, he worked for Halliburton. Have you guys all heard about Halliburton? I was there when he took over in 69, and I'm going to talk about that. Because not an American, right? I have two passports, Canadian and Australian. So basically anywhere in the world when stuff hits the fan, the Americans go first, right? Oh my God, they're evacuating the Americans, not the Canadians. We stayed through everything. Didn't think anything of it, but the Americans always bailed. <laughs> you talk about why and 
in the sense that Americans felt that they were the targets and sure. the reasoning why they felt we had Mm -hmm. Well, also I think you have to understand right the times. I was going to say the times were tumultuous, but you'd have to go back a lot farther than this to find a time in the region that wasn't tumultuous. Certainly today it's tumultuous. Um, say that again. There was a movie, right? Argo, or I think it was called Argo. Oh, you're talking about Iran, the Iranian Revolution. We'll get to that. Because I'll tell you where I was during the Iranian Revolution. Not an American in sight, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, we can talk about why that is. I think it's kind of obvious, but we can, we can get to that. Okay, so from the time that I was six months old until uh, I graduated from high school, um, I lived outside of my passport holding countries. Okay, so I am, look at that, very fancy, A uh, T C K. has anyone ever heard of this? Because most of you are this. I'm a third culture kid. Have you ever heard of that? So a third culture kid is someone who grew up in a third culture, outside of either their passport holding country, outside of their parents' um, national, nationality or nation, and in the culture of another place to which we don't actually belong. Okay? So for when I say some of you are third culture kids, what's your third culture? You're sitting in it. Yeah. Okay. That's me. That was me in Kenya. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, so I'm a third culture kid, but now I'm an ATCK, which means I'm an adult third culture kid. All right? So a, a third culture kid is a person who spent a significant part of his or her developmental years outside of um, their parents' culture. So this is a definition of third culture kid. This is a really big thing now. When I was growing up, I didn't know what this was. I'd never heard of such a thing. And it really wasn't until I was in my 40s um, that this sort of became something that more and more people were talking about. Pollock and Van Recken are sort of considered the two experts in um, third culture kid sociology and psychology. But it's basically this. A person has spent significant time outside of her development, blah, blah, blah. But you read that, right? Um, you, so third culture kids build relationships um, to all the cultures in which they belong um, while not having full ownership of any, right? Because you're always the other. If I had looked like some of you growing up there, I probably would have been different. But I looked like this growing up there. And so no matter what I did, whether I was fluent in the culture, in the language, um, in the customs, I was always going to be other, right? No matter how hard I tried. Um, so although elements from each culture are assimilated into third culture kids' life experience, a sense of belonging is in relationship to others of sim similar background. So we really do tend to gravitate toward each other, which is why when you all walked in, I said, right, like I feel my people here. And um, for those of you who don't use Facebook anymore, for people like me, best thing ever. Because all of a sudden, we could connect with people who we hadn't seen in 25, 30 years. So you guys grow up with this sort of instant WhatsApp and Skype and all the rest of it. We had none of that. When you were gone, you were gone. Snail mail took weeks, right? So what we learned to do really well was to walk away from relationships and just keep going. So on the one hand, good. On the other hand, not so good, right? We don't really care about very many people. <laughs> All right, so what was different about me, okay? Um, what makes my experience unique is that I lived in only one culture as a third culture kid. So it's really common that third culture kids would be in you know, Thailand for a couple of years, and then they would move to Kenya for a couple of years, and then they may go to The Hague for a couple of years, um, depending on what their parents did. It was unusual, very unusual. In fact, I was the only one of my friends who spent that entire time in one culture. All right? Um, this is my graduating class. Yes, that's exactly what it looks like. It was a big deal. I'm not sure if they're allowed to do any more, but we did it back in 1985. Okay, so I lived in or traveled to 13 countries in the Middle East over a period of 18 years. My parents were really good about taking advantage of where we were. So we lived there, but we were always traveling throughout the region, which I'm incredibly grateful for. 
all right? So what is cultural identity? So it's a feeling of belonging to a group, right? These are my photographs from when I was growing up. That's actually from Egypt. Um, it's part of a person's self-perception or self-conception and self-perception. So how you think of yourself is your identity, your cultural identity. Okay? For me, like you, that self-conception and self-perception comes from where I grew up. Right? So these are, for me, sort of visual stimuli of, of what I think of as home. All right? This actually all happen to be Egypt, but there are other uh, places certainly that I identify with. Okay, so how is culture subconsciously infused? So through symbols. And again, these are things that we sort of don't think about, that we take for granted, but when you really start thinking about them, I feel like all of you could find some things that you really relate to. Okay, so anything that carries particular meaning recognized by people who share the same culture. So clearly, this is a symbol that I would recognize anywhere, right, along with this one. And I suspect a lot of you recognize those. All right, language, that's a big one. Um, so it's a system of symbols that allows people to communicate with one another. Values, a little less tangible. Okay, but there are some very specific values that are indigenous to this region, right? Hospitality is one of them. Cultural belief, uh, culturally defined standards of desirability, beauty, and many of the things that serve as broad guidelines for social living. Um, family, huge part of um, Middle Eastern Arab culture. Beliefs, specific statements that people hold to be true. So again, you can't really be in that region without an acute awareness of religion. And I put this up here. Anybody figure out why I put this up here? From, from yeah, it is. Right, Egypt, right, Syria, Lebanon. There are always populations of uh, Orthodox Christians. Um, I should have put Judaism up there, not because of, of Israel, but because in almost every country I lived at some point, there had been a vibrant uh, Jewish minority, particularly in Egypt, um, and, and not so much anymore, unfortunately. I think there are about 300 Jews remaining in Egypt when there used to be a population of several thousand. Okay, and so norms, rules and expectations by which society guides the behaviors of its members. So certainly one of the most visible norms in the Arab world and the Middle East is um, cons conservatism, right? The way people, the way people dress, uh, the way they commune together or not, um, and sort of unspoken or sometimes spoken rules of, of behavior and conduct. Artifacts. This is one of my favorites. I'm completely obsessed. Professor Aldada knows that I have these everywhere. Um, so distinct material objects, such as architecture, technology, and artistic creation, right? Social institutions, and this is a little bit harder to kind of pin down, but again, these are pretty universal to the region. So what are we doing here? Can you, can you tell? Yeah, so sitting in, this is actually in, in Cairo, sitting like in a little corner, like literally any corner they can turn into like a little shisha place, right? Um, and then what do you think this is? Where do you think this is? Some of you should know. Hmm? Well, I don't know if it's Mecca per se, but who's that? Yeah, he was. He's now deceased. Okay, and then what about this? So this is actually an Egyptian classroom, right? This is public school. So uh, patterns of organization, relationships regarding governance, uh, production, socialization, education. So. Believe it or not, all of these things have shaped you. Whether or not you can articulate it or you're conscious of it, it has. And when you look at this and you think about yourself, are there certain times and places and things that come to mind that you really identify with, right? The answer is yes. Whether you know it or not, the answer is yes. Okay, oh, and there's, did anyone who, who know who these two guys are? Yeah, it's Abdel Fattah Sisi and um, the King of Saudi Arabia a little contentious relationship at the moment. 
Okay, so in Libya, I lived in Libya from 1967 to 1972, which does bring us to the situation with Gaddafi. But we'll get there in a second. That's my brother and me, uh, and a little pool in our backyard in Benghazi. Um, this is us playing, I don't know about that cat, but I can tell you about the turtles. <laughs> turtles were everywhere. Um, and we used to go to this place up on the coast called Cyrene. It, it was uh, ruins from, from uh, the Roman Empire. And we would always find these little tiny turtles and we'd put them in our pockets and bring them home. And my parents were like, for crying out loud, start bringing turtles home. But we always did. And then we would have all these turtles in the backyard. Um, in 1969, as you remarked, um, Libya, there was a, a monarchy uh, that was in place in Libya, and there was a, a coup. Um, and uh, Colonel Gaddafi overthrew um, the monarchy and um, took over in Libya. So what I remember about that, I actually don't remember um, Americans leaving, I was completely unaware of any of that. I do remember uh, the fighting. I remember sort of running from the front of the house into the garage to get, um, my mom had stored like canned goods in the garage so that we wouldn't have to go out sort of in the middle of it. I have one or two memories. I don't, honestly, don't even know how long it lasted. It didn't last very long. But I definitely remember shooting, I remember tanks in the street. I wasn't particularly concerned. Apparently none of us were because we stayed. Um, and there is Uncle Gaddafi right there. Does anyone know who these two guys are? Yes. No, that's Nasser, right? And who's that? He was the president of Syria at the time. So what do you think was going on here? I mean, I know it's a meeting, but there's sort of a larger phenomenon in the region at this time represented by Yes, exactly. So I was there sort of at the height of the Pan-Arab movement, right? Uh, so this is my, this is my brother, uh, my brother and me. I don't know who this kid is. Um, <laughs> but that's the Mediterranean Sea in the background. And here we are at Cyrene, the, the, the Roman ruins that I was telling you about. Um, this was my kindergarten class. That's me right there. And then this is actually me at Christmas, clearly. What you can't see is I was holding a Barbie doll. I was pretty happy at my, with myself. But, you know, this is, was there. This wasn't here. I literally never had a Christmas outside of the Middle East until my first year of university. And this is what I remember in terms of clothing and tradition. This one right here. Um, when I was there in the 60s, the more traditional dress for women was, was white, which you don't see as much. You do see it sometimes in North Africa, but certainly not in other regions of the Middle East. So, right, so what I remember in terms of these other phenomenon, right? Um, so I remember certainly being different. I, little kids would come up and, and, and touch me and touch my hair, which I understand, I look different. Uh, and again, it was the 60s, so there wasn't a lot of exposure to uh, Westerners the way there is today. Um, this cultural acuity, like I had a sense pretty early on that even though I was different, I got, I felt like I knew what was happening. I remember, I don't know how old I was, but I do remember the first uh, Ramadan and the first Eid. These little, these people who lived next door to us had kids about our age. And for a couple of weeks leading up to Eid, um, they had a goat. And I thought the goat was adorable. And we used to go over there and play with the goat. And I thought it was awesome. How cool. I want a goat too. And then I remember what happened with the goat. And certainly being shocked. But then the next time it happened, right on. We're going to have a goat. Right? <laughs> it's going to be good. Um, and then, of course, the revolution, which, which I already described. Um, remember it, don't remember, feeling terribly concerned about it. And then hospitality. OK, so, um, so I'm going to repeat the story. So if you've heard me, go ahead and zone out. Um, we were coming back from some weekend holiday, and we had stopped to get gas. 
and a man that my father, who worked for my father, pulled into the gas station. And he was certainly of a different socioeconomic class than we were. He was probably quite poor. Um, but he saw my father, who was you know, his superior, and he said, oh my goodness, you have to come to my house. If you don't come to my house, I'll be insulted. So most of you know that when you have an invitation, you really can't say no. So off we went um, to his house, um, which was kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, it was basically three rooms. I think there was a kitchen, maybe four rooms. A kitchen, bathroom, a main room, and then a smaller room. And so it was my mother, my father, and my brother and me. And I was probably five, maybe. Um, and immediately they put my mother and brother and me in a separate room with all the women. There were a lot of women in there, women and children, all sitting on the floor along the wall. And my dad got to sit out there with, uh, with the men. And about an hour or two later, they invited us out to eat. Very typical. But we were actually not like the other women. The other women stayed in the room. My mother and I and my brother came out to eat because we were, you know, guests of honor. We ate, very typical. It was probably goat um, and, and probably rice and some vegetables on the floor with our hands. Again, very common. And then right before we got ready to get, go, I said that I had to go to the bathroom. So they pointed the way to the bathroom and I went in and closed the door and there was half a goat hanging behind the door. All right, no worries. Okay, in 1972, we moved to Saudi Arabia. We were from Saudi Arabia from 1972 to 1978. Um, and we lived in Tehran, so it's in the eastern province, right, where all the oil is. So here's what I think about um, when I think about the kingdom, right? Very uh, traditional, um, especially at that time, but even, of course, still today. So these scenes, right, are scenes, they're photographs that my, my parents took. Um, this not so much, this is obviously modern. Does anyone know who this is? King Faisal, King Faisal yeah. And I'll tell you about him in a second. Um, so tradition was a big part of my experience there. Um, the thing that I will say about King Faisal does anyone know what happened to King Faisal? Yeah, he was assassinated uh, by his nephew in 1975. Um, I knew who King Faisal was. I couldn't tell you who the President of the United States was. I certainly couldn't tell you who the Prime Minister of Australia or Canada was, but I knew who King Faisal was. And when he was killed, all of us really were in mourning. He was a, he was a good man. Um, um, and you know the country sort of went into sort of a very traditional 40 days of mourning, but and I don't know if they do it so much in Saudi Arabia anymore. The last time I was in, in the kingdom was in the early 1990s, um, but in those days you couldn't go down a main road without seeing his picture. It's kind of common, and I, I hesitate to use the word, but I'm going to do it, in authoritarian regimes where they put up big pictures so that everybody gets to see who the leader is. There were pictures of him everywhere, um, as well as sort of the Saudi flag and, you know, the emblem of the palm tree and the, and the swords, right? Um, I will say, however, that we were really isolated in, in the kingdom. And part of that has to do with their own cultural values. So all expatriates um, were lived, and they still do, you live in a compound. So it's a compound usually specific to your company. And um, there are walls that go around it, and you really don't go outside those walls. I mean, of course you can, we did, but you wouldn't just haphazardly venture outside the walls. It was against the rules, our, my family's rules. Um, so, so there was an intentional separateness and we definitely felt it. This is um, my school and this is actually, uh, the school was on the grounds of the American consulate in Tehran. Um, and generally, Saudis were not allowed to attend the school. So it was a bunch of basically expat kids running around. Um, so unlike in Libya, and certainly later when I was in Egypt, we were not welcomed into the overall culture. And in fact, see this is the compound, there's the wall. Um, when I was there, and I believe this still may be the case, some of you can correct me, but once you hit ninth grade, 
Western students were not allowed in the kingdom. You had to go to boarding school. Um, do you know, does anyone know, does that still happen with Westerners? No? Okay, well it did, and I think that must be a fairly recent phenomenon that they are allowed to stay, because we were not allowed to stay, which was fine. I wasn't old enough to go away to boarding school anyway. Um, so the other thing that I think about when I think of the kingdom is I think of what are called landscape paradoxes. So it's an incredibly dry region, right? But everywhere you looked, there was greenery. And it was very specific greenery. Any idea why? It's kind of odd. Hmm? So yeah, soil and heat is not very conducive to a beautiful landscape. But aside from the greenery, which, what was really, really common was water features everywhere. There were water fountains on every corner. And I'm not talking the kind you drink out of, like the big fancy schmancy ones, right? And so I think, right, they had a lot of money. And so I think that this was a way to show their wealth, that they could kind of be irresponsible with water. Uh, which they were. They also have a massive desalination plants, right? In, in the kingdom that they don't, it's very expensive to desalinate. You all know what desalination is? To remove the salt from the water? Um, that's me. Okay, so food. So this is really kind of where I fell in love with Middle Eastern food. Um, we used to go out every weekend with my parents and um, Yum Shwarma. Right? There was this fabulous place, like in a little hole in the wall in the middle of Alcobar, and I used to beg my parents to take me there all the time. I did just a, about a year and a half in, uh, in Kuwait. Didn't love it. I have to say, of all the places that I live, this was my least favorite. Okay? Has, any, has anyone here Kuwaiti been to Kuwait? Nope? Okay. Um, so, a lot of money. Which isn't to say that Saudi Arabia didn't have a lot of money, they clearly did. But I think because Kuwait was so small and the population was so small, the wealth was really, really concentrated. So there was a really significant feeling uh, about us and them, money and not so much money, right? Um, everyone had super fancy cars, and there was these gold souks, which are not uncommon to the region, but there seemed to be a lot of them in Kuwait. Um, there were also a lot of car accidents. Don't know why. I guess people were driving like maniacs, but it was very, very common to see car accidents. Um, and the other thing were the houses. So gone was the compound, and they would put expats in these lavish, really lavish homes. We had, um, for lack of a more appropriate word, we had servants' quarters outside. We didn't have servants, but we certainly had servants' quarters. Um, and we had the Al Sabah. Do you all know who the Al Sabah is? The Al Sabahs are the royal family in Kuwait. The Al Sabah students went to our school. Um, and again, you could really tell there was a difference between us and them. And one of the things that we used to do for entertainment was we would, a couple of times a year, we would drive around and look at the houses because they were insane. Even then, I can only imagine what they were like now. So there was a feeling of separateness, right? We were not. It, unlike Saudi Arabia, where you were intentionally not included, but you kind of understood why, in Kuwait, you were socially not included, right? There was definitely a feeling of we were just, we, expatriates, were just there to kind of help them get it done, whatever was they needed getting done, and then you sort of didn't mix. So it wasn't intentional segregation the way it was in the kingdom. It was more of social segregation. I did not hang out with Kuwaiti kids. Most of my friends were Palestinian. Why? Why Palestinian? Yeah, right, and they certainly paid the price in uh, 1991, the Palestinians. Do you all know what happened to the Palestinians in Kuwait in 1991? Yeah, so Saddam Hussein, as you know, invaded Kuwait in 1990, and um, the Palestinians, many of them were supportive of Saddam Hussein. And so they paid a very heavy price when, uh, when Kuwait was liberated. Um, a lot of my friends, um, their families lost everything, lost their homes, lost their job, lost all their money because the Kuwaitis didn't forget. Okay, so this is again is a very typical, this would be like a very typical expatriate house. This was the uh, Gazelle Club, which was a private club that we belonged to. But again, only expatriates at that club. Um, and then, of course, I became sort of 
for, aware for the first time, even though I was certainly aware of some things when we were in the kingdom, certainly the death of King Faisal, but for the first time I was really profoundly aware of the political turmoil in the region. And part of it was that I was there 1978 to 1980. Um, so 19, 1979 is, by many accounts, um, considered a turning point in, in world history as well as um, specifically the history of, of the Arab world. Why? What happened in 1979? Yeah, the Iranian Revolution, right there. So we were in Kuwait when this happened. And again, Americans hightailed it out of there in a big hurry. Um, we did not. We stayed. And I do remember feeling uh, um, a little more cautious. Not because I thought, I think everyone, especially right there, because you know Kuwait is so close to Iran. Um, there was real, real thought that this type of revolutionary zeal would spread. And what that would look like, I, I, I don't know. Um, but but the, the, the regimes became pretty controlling, not, not repressive, but controlling. So Kuwait had been fairly open. Um, you could buy alcohol, women didn't cover, and as soon as the revolution hit, they went the complete opposite. All alcohol was banned, women had to cover. Um, and so I think it's a very common reaction um, to sort of this conservative vibe that was coming, um, coming out of Iran. And of course, you know, the hostage crisis. Um, but there was also this, what's this? Do you all remember this? Or no, you don't remember it because you weren't born. But um, So yeah, these were the peace accords between um, Begin and Sadat. And this was a big deal because the one thing that you never said, that you never read about, that you never saw was anything that had to do with Israel. Um, doesn't matter where we were. So you would get a textbook in an American school with an American curriculum and somebody had gone through that textbook with a black marker and had marked out every single word that said Israel or Israeli or Jew. Black mark, didn't exist, right? Um, you did not go, you couldn't, you couldn't leave from an Arab state and fly into Israel. Because if you did, you'd never get back into where you came from because if you had a stamp in your passport, you were done, right? So anyone who did do it, we didn't do it. Um, you would get an extra piece of paper in your passport so that you wouldn't get held up trying to get back into your home where you came from. Um, so this was kind of a really big deal in the Middle East because, I mean, the Palestinian issue for Arabs in the region is, was then and still is one of the things that can really unite Arabs together is sort of the pro-Palestinian perspective. Um, so this peace treaty between Sadat and, and Begin was a big deal, and there were a lot of Arab states who were really, really angry, particularly with Egypt. And of course, Sadat himself ultimately paid the price for that. And then, of course, what's this that happened in 1979? It was a bad year. Was that the war? No, that was in 1980. But yeah, we got out of uh, we got out of Kuwait really before that started. We went to Egypt, but. Nope. Russian yes, the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, so that was another really big deal because, of course, it's smack in the middle of the Cold War. Um, the United States has just lost its relationship with Iran, one of its you know strongest allies for decades. Um, so now Iran's out of the picture, and then of course the Soviets invade Afghanistan. So there was a lot of concern on the part of Americans, in particular, that this was the beginning of the end of American hegemony in in the Middle East. It wasn't, but there was certainly a sense um, that there was. All right. So then um, we moved to Egypt. By this time, I was about 12. And uh, we stayed in Egypt until 1995 when I graduated from high school. So I think the reason that I have such deep affection um, for Egypt more than anywhere else is because of the years that I was there. I was there from 12 to 18. Really, really formative years for anybody. Um, and sort of the isolation that was either intentionally imposed or socially imposed or culturally uh, imposed by some of the other places where I had lived, that was not the case in Egypt. Has anyone ever been to Egypt? 
yeah. Um, so although we did live in sort of a separate, we lived in a, in a suburb of Cairo called Maadi, and that's where a lot of expatriates lived, live. Um, we had Egyptian friends and we hung out downtown in Cairo and we went, although it was an American school, there were a lot of Egyptians at the school. And so for the first time, I was really in a position to socialize with kids my age who were indigenous. And, and Egyptians by, by culture are very um, welcoming and very warm and very open. I think it comes from you know, 5,000 plus years of, of dealing with people from all over the region coming in and out uh, for good or for bad. That's me, it was actually me in Kenya. Um, this is not a great picture, but this is me and my grandfather and our Boab. Does anyone know what a Boab is? Yeah. So most homes in Egypt have basically someone who takes care of the building, and they live in the building, and so that was our Bawab. Um, so these are just some scenes. This is uh, me in Alexandria. Um, so for me, these pictures represent sort of people, not necessarily people that I know, because I actually don't know them but certainly my sense of comfort and belonging in this place for the first time. And this is actually an Israeli soldier. That's a whole different story, which I'll get to. It's not as exciting as it sounds. Um, but the other thing was um, sort of this infusion of Western culture, which I wasn't really used to. Um, so yeah, I was a cheerleader. I don't like to admit that publicly. Um, and then this is actually a homecoming parade. How many of you have been here for things like homecoming and prom, sort of these very Western rites of passage? So we had those. Did you do that over, was there a sport at the center of like years? So it wasn't football. We didn't play football. Um, it was basketball. It was basketball. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this was in my apartment building, actually, where I lived. This is uh, me on the track team. Koshri, has anyone ever had Koshri? Yummy. Okay, and so for the first time I really felt like, not that I wasn't content before, but definitely like just an ease of life. Like everything felt very comfortable. It felt, um, uh, it felt like it was really me and it was really mine and I belonged there and, and I wasn't as unusual looking there as I had been in some other, some other places. Um, those are just some of the little Egyptian girls. This was my um, junior and senior prom date. Uh, he was Egyptian, my first big, big time boyfriend. Um, we're still in touch, he lives in Dubai. It's my mom and me, riding donkeys. Um, so, so in the midst of all of this sort of, you know, coming of age and the sense of belonging and everything kind of, you know, being the way it should be for, kids at that age was also this idea that it was going to end. Because there was always an end, right? Um, when I was in the summer of my junior year, we, were, we had come to Canada to visit my grandparents. And um, my father got called away really early in the morning. And uh, he came back and he said, I've been transferred. So these were always the words, you're just like, oh my gosh, again. And I remember saying to my dad, there is no way, <laughs> you can imagine, a 17-year-old girl, there is no way I'm coming back. No way. I like threw a fit, yeah. And did he have, did he have any say in or was it, you go here, you go there? Or you lose your job. That was it. Yeah, he had two choices on this particular assignment. He could have gone to Indonesia or come back to Canada. And in his defense, um, I think he was, I know he was thinking about me, right? She's gonna graduate, we need to put down roots. And so his choice was to come back. And um, I had a fit. And I think I cried for like four days. <laughs> My mother was the nurse at our school, at the American school there. And um, after much crying and, and screaming and gnashing of teeth and temper tantrum throwing, it was decided that my mother and I would come back and she would continue working so that I could stay and graduate. And my father stayed in Canada and we basically separated for that year. Um, so I did go on to, to graduate and yes, we did have our graduation ceremonies at the pyramids. <laughs> 
Um, and this is me receiving um, my high school diploma at the base of the pyramids. So, so that's it. But it really isn't it, right? So this is me when I went back to Egypt in 2009 with uh, some of the Zabelin. Do you all, are you all familiar with Zabelin? Um, they are mostly Christian, um, and they are the trash collectors. Um, this was this boy that I met in Egypt uh, when I was in ninth grade. And this is that boy now. Yeah, I married him. <laughs> and those are our three sons. Um, but this issue of diaspora blues, right? So you're home, but you're not home. You don't belong there. You don't belong here. Um, and it's something that I, that I still live with. So I'm lucky um, that I chose a career. I, didn't, I mean, I didn't intentionally choose it. It kind of chose me. But um, so I get to go back, and I get to talk about it, and I get to teach about it. And whenever I have a chance, I, I take students there. But it's still very much a part of, of who I am. Um, when I, when I left Egypt and um, we moved to Canada, I did my undergrad degree in political science. I was going to be a lawyer. Um, that didn't happen um, because I went to visit McGill, a friend of mine at McGill, and they had um, a separate institute for Islamic studies there. And so I applied to do my master's, and I got my master's in Islamic studies. Um, and then when I moved to the States to marry that boy, um, I did work for quite some time in um, a Middle East-related NGO. So I got to get my Middle East on that way. And then when I had children, I took some time off um, and went back and did my master's in education. Not because I wanted necessarily to teach about the Middle East, but because I wanted to have the same schedule as my kids. And then I was really lucky um, that teaching in a private school, I can choose to teach about this. So it is still a pretty profound part of who I am. Um, I think it will always be a profound part of who I am. If you walk into my home, it really does look like you've walked back into the Middle East. Um, my children, not so much. I have taken this one um, to the Middle East. The other two we'll see. But they certainly, obviously, don't feel what I feel because their sense of identity, their sense of belonging and culture is here. And they absolutely don't get it. Um, so yeah, that's my story. Um, and I hope that you saw some of yourselves in this, because some of you actually are living this story, but kind of in reverse, right? All right, well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it.